Hi, everyone. I'm Lawrence, and I'm the AI advocacy lead here at Google. My goal and the goal of my team is to inform and inspire the world at scale about the possibilities with AI and ML. Machine learning is the process of taking existing known data and using it to create an inference model that can let us make predictions about unseen data. And the process of building the world's leading machine learning frameworks has been just that. In 2016, when Google first open sourced TensorFlow, the world was a different place than what it is today. When it came to artificial intelligence and machine learning, the number of people with skills in it were counted in the thousands. Today, they're counted in the millions, tomorrow in the tens of millions. And of course, the number of people with skills to create applications that use AI and ML grow, and then the surface area of a platform to enable all of their scenarios needs to grow too. While there are many audiences, I'm going to focus primarily on the audiences of software developers and researchers today, while noting that there are two main types of researcher. There are those who are focused on researching and advancing AI technologies themselves, and there are those who are focused on advancing overall knowledge using AI as an assistive tool. In many ways, that audience can have similar needs to developers. Research has shown that in 2022, there are an estimated 24 million software developers in the world, and this number is due to grow to almost double that, 45 million, by 2030. And while many of these software developers will have AI and ML as their full-time job, most of them won't. But as many as 25%, over 10 million developers, will use AI and ML in their development process. Their primary identity might be as mobile, web, cloud, embedded systems developers, that kind of thing. But a core part of their job will be in training, deploying, and managing machine learning models. It's a massive opportunity. It's these developers who will build valuable solutions that most of us haven't even thought of yet. Solutions like Magic Erase, where a model small enough to fit on a phone can perform what would have needed heavy-duty, expensive tools and a particular skill set to do not that long ago. Or this really fun project that used an object detection algorithm along with a 3D printer to spot printing flaws and quit printing when that happens, avoiding wastage. Or this one, an innovative use of AI to help spot when people fall in nursing homes without using cameras in order to maintain patients' privacy. It uses radar imaging, and it's capable not just of seeing where a person may have fallen, but also to be able to see around objects or other people to detect falls so that help may be called quickly. But let's not also forget about the cutting edge of AI advanced research that gives us things like AlphaFold, Lambda, Mum, Imagine, and much, much more. To achieve all of this and more, and in the years we've been working on building frameworks, libraries, infrastructure, samples, materials, and all that, we've learned that the workflow of going from zero to a working solution that uses a model typically falls into a common set of stages. It all starts with data. And data comes in all shapes and sizes, from simple text or CSV files, all the way up to complex distributed relational databases. When you're working on a solution that's enhanced by AI and ML, you need to understand your data, and you need code that helps you ingest and pre-process it. Once you have your data, and you have it in a shape that's possible to train a model with, you, of course, need APIs that will then help you create models. Now, this can be from scratch where you define the neural network yourself if you have those skills, as well as the ability to tweak and experiment with your model. Or it can be using an existing model that you fine tune for your own needs. Or of course, it could be the result of a neural architecture search against your data and requirements. Whatever the best method you use, the point is the same. You need a framework that lets you figure out the best architecture to learn from your data and an easy way to implement that. The next step, once you've gotten a trained model, is being able to have a place where it will execute, and you can put it into the hands of your users. From researchers with a relatively small deployment surface area, enough to prove and defend your thesis, to developers who need to scale to billions, the ultimate need is the same. How do I get my model in a place where people can use it, where I can pass data to it and get inferences back? How can I measure the accuracy and performance of my model in conditions that I hadn't previously considered? 
And most importantly, flexibility is key. And as a result, the need to deploy to anything from the massive scalable cloud to traditional web servers, to JavaScript in the browser, to mobile devices like Android or iOS, to embedded systems running on single board computers like Raspberry Pi, all the way down to microcontrollers that operate in devices as simple as a sensor. You'll need a framework that lets you run your models on any of these runtimes, and that will give you the keys to success. And mostly, for developers now, once your model's in the wild, your job has only just begun. Using the model effectively and building a business around it, like any other software, is a process of constant improvement. Models are data-driven. And new data, in particular about how your model is used and what works and what doesn't, will be generated frequently. So you need to monitor and maintain your model to continue that cycle, to continuously improve, create new versions of your model, deploy them, and profit. So beyond the software and frameworks for data, modeling, deployment, and maintenance, there's also the opportunity to improve the life cycle through accelerated infrastructure that can optimize each of these steps. And of course, you need tools that keep responsible AI top of mind. Like any other software system, an ML1 is prone to bugs. And with great power comes great responsibility. So tooling that helps you spot, prevent, or mitigate bugs in powerful AI systems is essential. And one thing that's really nice is that given we're in the early days of the AI revolution, that the thought process around responsibility is going into these right now. So what we've been building and what we're working towards is a coherent and consistent set of APIs and platforms for everyone, from hobbyists to developers to researchers, so that they can have a free and open source ecosystem where all of these will work together in harmony. And we call that vision Tensor Projects. It's our commitment to you that as more and more developers come online wanting to use AI and ML, and as the scenarios get ever more complex, that we will have free and open source ecosystem that meets your needs. So let's look at that in more detail, starting with data. Data is the first of our columns. If you're building machine learning models, you're probably spending a lot of time thinking about your data. A machine learning model is only as good as the data that's used to train it. So we want to make sure that you have the best tools to acquire data from a variety of sources, from simple text and CSV files, all the way up to global scale relational databases. And once you have the data, you need to be able to pre-process it. Often the real data that you need simply isn't in a column, but it can be a function of many data items that needs to be extracted. And then, of course, you need to use it with APIs that work directly with your training frameworks and line up neatly without you needing to write a lot of extra code. And we've been working on lots of tools to help you on this in part of your workflow. Tools like TensorFlow datasets, a collection of ready-to-use data sets from Google and the community. You can access them with just one or two lines of code, and they're incredibly useful if you want to quickly prototype a model. For example, perhaps you want to build a model for spotting crop diseases, and you want to see if you can build a predictive model with high accuracy and precision. The Cassava dataset is ideal for this, and you can retrieve it with just a few lines of code using TensorFlow datasets and then evaluate the performance of a simple model before you spend time gathering and labeling additional data. With dozens of data sets across a variety of domains, you have coverage for lots of scenarios. Some of them might be something like your own and will give you a head start in designing your overall architecture. These data sets can be used out of the box in Python, but not just for ML. But if you are using ML, then they're available for TensorFlow, JAX, and of course, other ML frameworks. When I'm looking through data sets for inspiration, I'll often turn to Kaggle. Kaggle hosts one of the largest communities of data scientists and machine learning engineers in the world, with over 10 million users, 10,000 public data sets, and over 600,000 notebooks. We learn best when we learn from each other. Now, once you've found your data set and you're ready to start training your model, you can use the TensorFlow data APIs to cleanse and pre-process that data and prepare it for training. When it comes to machine learning, a lot of the academic focus is placed on the model architecture and hyperparameter tuning. But when you actually look at the code that's written, this part is for the model, and this is for the pre-processing of the data. 
So we build open source APIs that help reduce and simplify the pre-processing and lessen the time it takes you to build a model. The TF record format and the TF data APIs make it much simpler to complete important data pre-processing tasks like slicing your data, splitting it, shuffling it, sharding large data sets across a number of input pipelines, and augmenting data on the fly. So you've gotten your data, and you have it in pretty good shape. Next up, you want to see how you can use that data to train a model for inference. Now, when you start your ML journey, it can seem so alien, so complex, and so abstract. You're used to writing code to solve problems, but this new paradigm has you training a model to do it for you. And how do you even get started? Well, let's first look back at the overall ecosystem and the columns that make up the phases of creating ML-based products. We just looked at data, so now we'll dive into model architecture definition and training. Now, there's a number of options that you can use here, and you've likely heard of Keras, TensorFlow, and JAX. So let's take a look at these and how you might choose to use each one. I'll start with Keras. It's designed to make bringing AI models to code very easy, with an API that works from the simplest Hello World models all the way up to cutting edge, research-oriented models like this one, which incredibly can understand what an AI pays attention to when it's classifying an image, and which can segment the image into backgrounds and people. Now, there's some great stuff that has been done in Keras from this Pathfinder model from Google Research that can predict the contents of previously unseen rooms in a building from a single observation, to this wonderful solution from the community that detects hidden objects behind larger objects using radar and convolutional neural networks. And if you're developing for mobile or embedded applications, I'd love to introduce you to TensorFlow Lite Model Maker, which, as its name suggests, is designed to take on complex tasks in model creation, such as data processing, training, evaluation, model optimization, conversion, and a whole lot more, and then wrap them up in an easy-to-use API that creates production-ready TF Lite models. Your code can then be reduced from this to this. Model Maker leverages transfer learning, which greatly reduces the amount of training data required and shortens the training time. And importantly, to build an app or a site, you need to integrate your model into something. Here, for example, is a high-level architecture for integrating an ML model into an Android app. Now, the clue is in the name, TensorFlow. Tensors flow in, tensors flow out. But you're probably more used to dealing with things like bitmaps, strings, and CV pixel buffers than tensors. So we created the task library to help with using the model on multiple platforms, including Android and iOS. And we're delighted to announce that Model Maker and the task library now support on-device large-scale similarity search through the Searcher API, powered by SCANN, Google's cutting-edge similarity search library, the Searcher API helps you find similar images, text, or audio from millions of data samples in just a few milliseconds. For example, in a photo gallery app, users can select a birthday party photo, and then the model will find similar photos from their photo gallery. And since this all happens on your device, no user data is ever sent to the server, protecting the user's privacy. And then, of course, there's JAX. If you could unravel a protein, you would see that it's like a string of beads made of a sequence of different chemicals known as amino acids. These sequences are assembled according to the genetic instructions of an organism's DNA. Attraction and repulsion between the 20 different types of amino acids cause the string to fold in a feat of spontaneous origami, forming the intricate curls, loops, and pleats of a protein's 3D structure. For decades, scientists have been trying to find a method to reliably determine a protein structure just from the sequence of amino acids. This grand scientific challenge is known as the protein folding problem. Experimental techniques for this can take months or years and cost millions. By training a model on 100,000 proteins, DeepMind can predict the shape of a protein to atomic accuracy, sometimes in minutes. JAX was at the heart of the intense numeric computing needed to train such a model. And you can download the code from GitHub if you want to explore it for yourself. And if you remember from the architecture diagram of the ecosystem I showed earlier, accelerated infrastructure underpins everything. JAX is designed to optimize your numeric computing for this infrastructure, powering projects like AlphaFold. But this infrastructure is available to all developers. 
and in particular, through TPUs and TPU pods. So, for example, if you're a TensorFlow developer and you want to take advantage of this kind of power, it's relatively easy to modify your code. For example, here's a simple Keras model that I've declared in code. And here's the modification to allow it to train using a distribution strategy on a TPU. It's so inspiring to see developers leverage Google-scale compute and infrastructure to train models with state-of-the-art capabilities. But the journey doesn't stop there. Once you've trained a model, now you need to deploy that model to production. And we've built tools that will give you greater flexibility for how and where your models can be used. So when using TensorFlow, you can deploy your models anywhere, from the scalable cloud to traditional web servers to the browser to cross-platform mobile devices, embedded systems, and all the way down to microcontrollers. And that's just the beginning of the story. Deploying a single model often isn't enough, and models will need to be constantly updated for bug fixes, for the latest updates based on new data, for issues with responsible use of the models, and so much more. If you're creating a product, you need to follow a production-level process. For machine learning, you'll need an MLOps process and infrastructure, and TFX is a great place to start. As the world and your business changes, you'll need not only CICD, but continuous training too. TFX makes that possible. TFX also helps you understand your model's performance at a deeper level so your customers can have a great experience with your product. You can train models in TFX for your mobile web or server-based applications, and you can run TFX just about anywhere, including in a web browser using Colab. It's in use in many Google products and by companies like Spotify and Twitter. And with over 10 million downloads, the chances are pretty good that you use an app or service that has been built using TFX. As you work to build responsible machine learning systems, model cards help provide context and transparency into a model's development and performance. And we're delighted to announce that you can now easily generate them using the model card generator TFX pipeline component. A very popular API in TFX is TensorFlow Serving. And this allows you to deploy your model on a server and perform remote inference. So we've launched four new learning pathways for Android, iOS, Flutter, and web developers to learn how to deploy a model to TF Serving and to use it on their platform of choice. And when it comes to deploying on mobile, we've gotten great feedback from Android developers who love using TensorFlow Lite, but don't like the burden of deploying the runtime with their app and then needing to continually update their app to get the newest version. So we're delighted to announce that TensorFlow Lite runtime is now available in billions of devices via Google Play services with regular updates. And this way, you know that your users will always have the latest, fastest version of TensorFlow Lite and that your APK size will be much smaller. Several Google teams, including MLKit, already use TensorFlow Lite in Google Play services, serving over 400 million monthly active users, running over 20 billion daily inferences. And you can benefit from this technology today with the public API. Having a platform that empowers developers like you to build inspirational solutions is what really excites me and gets me up in the morning. And none of it would have been possible without you, that great community of developers that just make it real. So with that, I'd like to say a great big thank you to all of you. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you will build with AI and ML.